Good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction, Kenneth, and thank you very much for the committee for inviting me to come and talk to you today. Okay. So, so I'm going to talk today um, about pregnant women who are having surgery that is not related to their pregnancy. Um, as Kenneth mentioned, I'm currently in Stanford, but I'm also affiliated to the Adassa Hebrew University Medical Center. The learning objectives are in your handout. I'm going to start with a short introduction and then um, give a roadmap of the talk this morning. I asked my children to find me a hypersensitive pregnant lady, um, and this is what they came up with for us today, this uh, delightful figure. Two out of 100 pregnant women are going to require some non-obstetric surgery, most likely for something like appendicitis, but maybe they'll have a trauma. And four out of 100 pregnant women may present to the emergency room with some sort of trauma. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So we all know how to anesthetize a healthy young woman if she's going to come for her surgery. But the moment she's pregnant, those hormones are kicking in and she's having physiological changes which are going to affect every part of her. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I would like to draw your attention to some excellent reviews where you can find some information about the physiological changes of pregnancy. I've decided to concentrate this morning on other areas. So this is the roadmap for this morning. We're going to talk about the logistics, drugs, radiology, surgical procedures, and special considerations, including um, who you're going to have to bring and what equipment you're going to have to bring when you have such a patient. And on the right-hand side at the top, the um, picture here um, will just guide us through exactly which part of the talk we're on. So the ASA Task Force recommends offering to all, all women who could be pregnant, their childbearing age, um, a pregnancy test if it will affect their management. And when should we do the surgery? So the ACOG bulletin from 2011 was quite clear that if a woman comes in and she needs surgery, even if she's pregnant, if the surgery is indicated, she should have that surgery. If possible, we'd like to delay that surgery until the second trimester. or even better, postpone until after delivery, but it's not always possible. And Dick Mason, um, looking at a Swedish registry um, published in 1989, that the majority of women who were pregnant who came for surgery that was not related to their pregnancy actually had their surgery in their first trimester. And where should this surgery be done? So ACOG very sensibly suggested that if you're going to be doing fetal monitoring and you're going to want to intervene if the baby has a problem, that the surgery should not be done in a cottage hospital like that pictured here, but rather the surgery should be done at an institution where there is a team suitable who can help the fetus if necessary. So now we have our pregnant lady and she's come in and she needs our services to get her off to sleep so the surgeon can do his job. And what are we gonna give? because we don't want to be drawing up drugs and ending up causing to the fetus something like this, a thalidomide picture at the top and a cleft lip which is associated with benzodiazepines. So the bottom line is that the statement of the, of the ASA House of Delegates 2009, non-obstetric surgery during pregnancy, that there are no currently used anesthetic agents that show any teratogenic effect in humans when using standard concentrations at any gestational age. I'm going to go into this in a little more detail, but I think we'd be pretty happy. This is a picture of my um, drug table for mastectomy cases that I was doing this week. I drew up all of these drugs, and I was asking myself if I had a pregnant patient for the same case, would I be able to draw up exactly the same drugs? Would my table look like that? So let's just go through and see what we can use. So the propofol is class B, um, no shown harm, um, and I can give fentanyl. Um, I can give um, rocuronium, succinylcholine. I can give um, my local anesthetics and my regular inotropes, which are class C. What about this little chap down here, the benzodiazepines? And the reason that I'm bringing this up with a question mark, I took this data from a chapter um, by um, Gist and Balin in, in a book called Anesthesia and the Fetus, but this is available in all the package inserts and on the FDA website, all of these um, pregnancy drug classes. And um, the book, um, Anesthesia and the Fetus, reminds us that midazolam is a benzodiazepine, and benzodiazepines are pregnancy class D, which actually is associated with some risk of fetal harm. This is coming from 
animal studies. So if we have an animal and we have tests showing that this drug might produce some teratogenicity in an animal, is that going to be relevant to a human? This is a little um, fetal rat. Is that going to be anything like our fetus that we're worried about? I'd just like to remind you that when thalidomide first came out, it had been tested in animals and didn't actually show any teratogenicity, and it was only after it showed limb problems in human babies that they went back and did some other studies in animals and found that there were problems. So the high-dose exposure models that are using in animals may not be relevant for us doing our short-exposure anesthesia. So if you want to look at midazolam, you've got to make a decision. You've got an anxious woman standing in front of you. You want to draw up your syringe of midazolam. Can you give it or can't you give it? Well, this study from 1984, New England Journal of Medicine, looked at 33,000 pregnant women and asked them to recall if they had taken diazepam in the first trimester, and 854 women had. And there was clinically no increased risk of oral clefts in women who had taken diazepam. And diazepam has been shown in animal studies to cause oral clefts as opposed to midazolam, which has not. So most experts seem to agree that a judicious single use of midazolam is not going to cause a cleft lip. What about our inhalational gases? Well, they're okay. They actually might be beneficial because they can cause some tocolysis, which might prevent preterm labor. So you'd think that the story is done, except that last week, after I prepared this lecture, I got a hysterical phone call from um, a family whose baby's about to have surgery this week, and they had read through the internet what the risks were, and instead of worrying about whether the baby was going to have pain after surgery, they wanted to know if he was going to reach his academic potential, and if the anaesthetist could possibly not use sevoflurane, because they had read that the sevoflurane was going to kill his brain. Well, there is actually some good evidence that if you give even small doses of isoflurane or gabamimetics in neonatal animals, in rats, that there might be some developmental delay and apoptosis. But is that actually going to be relevant to our nice little baby having surgery? And we can extrapolate that to the fetus inside the mother that we're going to be anesthetizing. So this is the sort of data that's out there in neonates. This is a population retrospective study of 10,000 siblings of whom only 304 were actually exposed to anesthesia. And the authors did report a slightly increased um, ish, um, problem of developmental behavioral disorders if the child had been exposed to anesthesia, inhalational gases, under the age of three. What are we going to do with that? Well, I would say that the data for animals, um, if you look into it in detail, is pretty convincing, but it really has um, not transferred over into um, childhood studies. And the authors of papers who talk about neonatal exposure to inhalational anesthetics will hedge their conclusions as uncertain and requiring more studies. And none of the investigations thus far have focused on pregnant women and their fetuses. So are we done with inhalational gases? Well, not quite, because you might have staff women who are pregnant, and there has been some evidence that pregnant women who are exposed occupationally to inhalational gases um, could have reproductive or other problems. So the recommended safe levels for anesthetic gas exposure seem to be arbitrary. There are two United States um, recommended levels. One is 25 parts per million. This is for nitrous oxide. And one is 50 parts per million. And if you live in Scandinavia, they're very generous on your behalf with the amount of nitrous oxide that you can receive, up to 100 parts per million. Um, the data originally came from unscavenged dental units, where there were 3,500 parts per million documented um, amounts of nitrous oxide in the air that the dentists and the assistants, and vicariously the dentists' wives, were breathing in. And from this data, it appears that there is no proven risk of genetic fetal abnormalities, but for pregnant working staff, there may be an association with infertility and abortion. But this situation can definitely be improved by good scavenging, which can enable safe occupational levels of anesthetic gases. So we're going to move on to x-rays. Can we x-ray our pregnant woman? I love this picture. Okay, so the fetus at four to 10 weeks is most sensitive to radiation exposure for organogenesis. And at 10 to 17 weeks, if the fetus is exposed, there have been some reports of radiation-induced mental retardation. Leukemia potentially could develop in childhood from a fetus who was exposed at any age. But just to get some proportion, the dose of 50 MSV is considered a safe dose. And if your woman has a whole body CT with full... Um, um, contrast media 
she will be receiving something around 25 MSV, and the low-dose protocol CT scans are giving something between 6 and 10 MSV. So if your woman accidentally or unintentionally gets some um, radiation um, in, a, in an investigation that has been done for her, the diagnostic exposure is unlikely to harm her fetus, and certainly the recommendation is that she would not be um, further counselled or offered a therapeutic termination. And it's important to talk about the um, x-rays and pregnant women because interventional radiology is something that we're seeing more and more and it may enable the pregnant woman to avoid surgery that the intervention in radiology may solve her problem. And when I was preparing for this talk, I did see one suggestion that a dosimeter could be used to measure the facial exposure, although I'm not actually sure what we would do with the um, results if there was a high amount or a low amount. And there was another paper that suggested that no way should a dosimeter be used because it would just confuse us, but something to think about. So the American College of Radiologists recommend that a pregnant woman have minimal radiation exposure, and there are some things that you can do in order to mitigate this. For example, increased distance from the x-rays for um, chest x-rays doing PA exposure, using increased CT slicing, shielding. Um, and it's very important that you know your own institutional guidelines so that you can promptly um, do treatment without a delay debating whether she can or she can't have the x-rays. So we're going to move on now to talk about some of the surgical procedures. This is a recent data, uh, more recent than the Swedish um, data, which has been um, quoted quite a lot up until now. Um, they have a very long name for this database. Um, it's the American College of Surgeons. Um, and looking over a four-year period, the authors identified almost 2,000 pregnant women who had had non-obstetric surgeries. And I've just brought out some of the data which I thought was quite interesting, that almost 50% of these women had an emergency procedure. Almost 90% had general anesthetic. And obviously, if we can, we'd like to do regional anesthesia for these women. But if you look at the surgeries that they were having, you can see why it probably wasn't possible. 77% of the women had an intra-abdominal procedure. And as we said before, the commonest procedure was an appendectomy. Laparoscopies performed for 64.8% of the women, and there were some other reasons as well for doing these surgeries. And what about the complications? So the authors created a composite of 30-day major postoperative complications, and they found that there were in, um, maternal complications in 5.8% of the women, and the mortality rate in this group was 0.25%. So we can see that laparoscopy is something that you can do in pregnant women. In fact, looking at the Swedish registry of 2 million women, around 2,000 had laparoscopy compared with 1,500 who had a laparotomy during pregnancy. And comparing the two techniques, there were similarly increased rates of both preterm birth and IUGR. And recommendations if you are doing laparoscopy in pregnant women to use DVT prophylaxis, to enter the abdomen directly, and to try and use low inflation pressures. I'm going to talk now about biliary tract infections, which is something that um, also we're seeing more and more um, interventions in pregnant women. So using the nationwide inpatient sample, which you may be familiar from work done by Brian Bateman and Jill Meyer, this is 20% of all hospital admissions over a year period um, are sampled in this database. So the authors here are identified from 1999 to 2006. 2.7% of all the biliary tract admissions during that period were pregnant women. Out of these women, there were 10,000 pregnant cholecystectomy cases, and 89% of them were done laparoscopically. The maternal complication rate was 4.3%, so a little lower than I presented in the previous slide. And something of relevance and possible interest, that the high-volume surgeons had lower complication rates doing cholecystectomy in pregnant women. Delaying cholecystectomy for complicated gallstones in pregnancy is associated with recurrent postpartum symptoms. So there may be a tendency if the woman comes in and she's got gallstone to say, well, you're pregnant, let's try and treat you conservatively, go away, we'll see what happens, hopefully we won't ever hear from you again. Well, you will hear from her again and she's going to have complications and if not during the pregnancy, then she's going to come back postpartum. So if surgical criteria would say that this lady needs a cholecystectomy, then she needs it even if she's pregnant. And there are reports of using ERCP. It's safe for acute cholangitis in pregnancy. The woman may not need surgery if she has it. And um, they've been mentioning that ERCP, actually there is a technique that can be done without fluoroscopy to avoid radiation. 
Acute pancreatitis also occurs, usually due to gallstones in pregnancy, although it is rare, and again, may require surgery. So carrying on with the conversation about ERCP and investigations, um, I just wanted to bring your attention to the sedation and endoscopy guidelines by the American Society for Gastroenterologists. It's a very compact and well-written um, guideline, but I wanted to um, show a couple of um, recommendations or comments that they make. Um, in Stanford, they have a lovely endoscopy suite where we do general anesthetic with the most perfect conditions, first world. But in Adassa, where I have been working, the endoscopy suite is something like a cave. Um, and if you are going to be called there emergently, it would not be a pleasant place to be working. So these guidelines recommend that if the patient is having deep sedation, an anesthesiologist is required that the um, gastroenterologist should be cautious administering sedation to the pregnant patient and to beware maternal over-sedation. So you may be in a situation as um, endoscopy is becoming more rife and ERCP might be an alternative to cholecystectomy that you're called to um, rescue a m maternal over-sedated patient in your endoscopy suite and perhaps go and have a look and see if you've got the right conditions to be able to manage that. Appendicitis, as we said, is the most common non-obstetric surgical procedure. Appendectomy is associated with preterm birth, IUGR, um, and neonatal deaths. Interestingly, the, if you compare pregnant appendix, appendicitis patients with the non-pregnant women, there is a significantly increased odds of medical management, sepsis, and laparotomy performed. So these suggest that there is some room for improvement to manage the pregnant appendicitis patient. I've put this picture here because I'd like if you come across a trauma patient, which I'm about to talk about next, for a picture like this or something similar to go into your head when you're seeing her. This is a humpback whale that we saw in Monterey Bay. And there could be a tendency when you see a pregnant patient to become so fixated on the hump at the front of her abdomen that you could actually lose concentration about everything else that's lurking beneath. So four out of 100 pregnant women will require hospital admission from trauma. The women who are going to die are going to have pelvic abdominal injuries or need to have an urgent cesarean delivery. Now, they may not be obviously pregnant, or they may be so distractingly pregnant that you forget to do everything else. ATLS recommends the three standard x-rays, chest, um, cervical, chest, and pelvis. And the re recommendation is that even if she's pregnant, she has the regular ATLS investigations. And other than airway management and um, a, le a left lateral tilt, she should be treated as if she's not pregnant. And the reason that I'm mentioning this is we did a study in Jerusalem. We found that in many cases, the pregnant woman would have a fetal well-being assessment before her heart rate and blood pressure were checked. And she may have an ultrasound of her abdomen to see if the baby is alive, but not actually receive a fast to see if she herself has free blood in her abdomen. So just not to get distracted if you have a pregnant patient um, coming in for a trauma. Um, just to, to skip through some other indications for, um, that you may come across, breast cancer is the commonest cancer surgery. Uh, pregnancy may hinder the early cancer diagnosis, and during pregnancy, the patient, if required, can have radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Neurosurgery procedures, um, the data that we have comes from case reports and series, usually be for a vascular problem or a neoplasm, and you may have to plan for pharmacologic uh, controlled hypotension, and I'm not going to go into the drugs and sodium nitroprusside, for example, in pregnant patients, um, and interventional radiology, as we discussed. And also for cardiac procedures, interventional radiology is something that you may be asked to get involved with anesthesia for these patients. Valve procedures are the most frequent intervention. Um, percutaneous interventions are safer for the fetus than open heart surgery. And as the maternal age is increasing, there are some reports now of MI um, and stent placement in pregnant women. If you need to plan for bypass, then it's important to maintain good pump pressures for uteroplacental perfusion and a hematocrit above 28. So now I'm going to talk about some of the um, special considerations. Who are you going to call? Who's going to be the team that's going to come together? What equipment are you going to bring to the operating room when you have your pregnant patient who's going to be needing um, non-obstetric surgery? We've got the um, fetal heart rate monitor, tilting, what airway protection and other equipment. So regarding uterine displacement, um, it's very nice um, ed editorial from um, Gertie Marx in Nigeria, 1992, um, brought up all the evidence for uterine displacement. 
Um, it would seem that the evidence supports um, left uterine tilt from 19 weeks, although I have seen in some other reviews a recommendation to consider it a little earlier than that, um, from any time in the second trimester. But definitely something to bear in mind in any, any treatment of a pregnant patient, um, even if she's having non-obstetric surgery, if she's having endoscopy, it should be done on the side, and if you're treating her for trauma. What about acid aspiration precautions? Well, I wanted to know, because I wasn't actually sure in my mind from exactly what week we need to start taking into account this. So I went back and looked at some of the literature. I haven't got a clear answer for this, but I want to show you some of the things that I found. Um, so Janet Weiner and Sheila Cohen, um, a seminal paper from 1982. They showed that in women who were pregnant up to 20 weeks, there was no increase in gastric volume or increase in low pH. Some of their colleagues from Stanford did show um, that they observed increased intragastic pressure from 15 weeks. Um, Peterson and Finster, in their review of managing pregnant women for non-obstetric surgery, wrote that intubation is necessary for surgery during pregnancy. And um, Sol Schneider, in the first edition of their uh, book, wrote intubation should be done from the third trimester unless there are symptoms of esophagitis. So it certainly seems that from the second trimester we should be thinking about acid aspiration precautions, including um, giving some pharmacologic therapies and considering doing an intubation. What about the fetal heart rate monitor? Well, this is recommended for the viable fetus only. There is no point in doing this in a 12-week or an 18-week pregnant um, mother, because you're probably not going to be able to um, get the monitor anyway, and you're not going to do anything even if you do find it. Some guidelines do suggest considering doing it from 18 to 22 weeks, but it's actually pretty tricky to get a reliable trace. And what are you going to do if the heart rate disappears? You're not going to deliver the baby, um, and it may just have gone to sleep because your anesthesia for the mother was so good. So the recommendation is that you should do it from 24 weeks, but there is a caveat. Um, and it's stated in the ACOG committee opinion that if you are going to do the monitoring, you have to have a person who's agreed to do the monitoring because they need to take responsibility for what's going to be happening. And they have to have access to the probe, so it has to be possible with the surgical technique. If there's going to be problems with the probe, they're going to have to move it around and fiddle with it. And there has to be a predefined plan of what you're going to do if the monitor is non-reassuring, which includes consenting the mother for an emergency cesarean delivery and having an available obstetrician with all the equipment that they can do that emergency cesarean delivery in the middle of surgery. Well, a lot of information. And if I was now faced with an obstetric patient who needed um, surgery for an appendicitis, I'm not sure that I could remember everything that I've told you this morning and put it all together in a quick package. Um, and we don't really want to be reinventing the wheel every time we do this. So I would urge everybody to make sure that you have, and if not, to build a, a multidisciplinary plan. Um, thanks to Dr. Hilton um, Carvalho in Stanford who have made this um, plan for non-obstetric surgery during pregnancy. Um, they did it with anesthesia colleagues, surgeons, MFMs, and neonatologists. And it's a two-page document that contains everything you would need to think about for the logistics, drugs, radiology, your surgery plan, fetal heart rate monitoring, uterine displacement, acid aspiration prophylaxis, who you need to call, where they're going to come from, who's responsible for bringing the resuscitator and all the cesarean section equipment, and who's going to do um, cesarean if it's going to need doing. Um, and Dr. Hilton has kindly offered, if anybody's interested in taking these guidelines and and either adopting them, amending them, or building your own plan from them, that she'd be very happy to send those out to you. So the bottom line, and just to summarize, if you have a woman of childbearing age, suspect pregnancy. Ideally, perform surgery in the second trimester, although we've seen that this is going to be challenging. Current anesthesia drugs in clinical doses are safe for the pregnant patient and the fetus. We need to make considerations of what is normal pregnant physiology, including tilting the patient and um, airway protection. Um, the outcome of the non-obstetric surgery is usually going to be disease dependent, and so it's very important to maintain the same level of care for the pregnant woman that you would do for her if she wasn't pregnant. And I urge everybody to have a multidisciplinary institutional written plan so that it will be plain sailing when you have these patients. Thank you very much. <laughs>